And welcome to Trust is Good, Control is Better, Finding the Right Balance. I am Eva Bosbach, Executive Director of the North America Office of the University of Cologne. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the eighth Transatlantic Tandem Talk of our series, which we established last year on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of our North America Office. It showcases various research topics from the University of Cologne in Germany and our partners here in the US. Today's topic explores management practices and the question of whether and under which circumstances control or trust might be better when it comes to companies monitoring their workers. Whether you are an employer, employee, researcher, student, or just interested in the topic, thank you all for being with us. It would not have been possible without our wonderful partners for the Transatlantic Tandem Talk series. So I want to thank the German Center for Research and Innovation, DWIH New York, the German Consulate General in New York, the German Academic Exchange Service, DAAD New York, Deutsches Haus at NYU, the Goethe Institute New York, the German Embassy in Washington DC, America House NRW, 1014 Space for Ideas, and the German Research Foundation, DFG North America. It is now my pleasure to hand over the floor to the Deputy Head of the International Office of the University of Cologne, Christiane Biel. Hello. Um, good evening, everyone, or good morning to New York. Um, I warm welcome on behalf of the University of Cologne and its international office. Um, the University of Cologne is not only among the best research universities in Germany, but is also one of the oldest in Europe, founded in 1388. And it is currently also one of the largest universities in Germany, with almost 50,000 students and a substantial number of international students and researchers. As a globally oriented research university, we seek to collaborate with the best scholars worldwide and to attract excellent students and doctoral candidates from all over the world. And against this backdrop, the University of Cologne has set up an international strategy pursuing the goals of internationalization, of course, of research, teaching and studies, and also assuming global responsibility. And to support these manifold international issues, the University of Cologne runs four regional offices beyond the one in North America. We also have one in China, in India, and in Egypt. And all of them serve the above mentioned strategy and contribute to enhancing our worldwide visibility. On the occasion of the 10 years anniversary of the North America office, at the beginning of 2021, we set up the series Transatlantic Tandem Talks. And throughout the past year, the two, past two years, um, these talks have been very successful, featuring research from our faculties and clusters of excellence and address topics of high societal relevance, such as Black Lives Matter, food security, language and political psychology, healthy aging, or immigration and Jewish life in the United States. Being the regional coordinator and also the responsible contact person here in Cologne for the Office of North America, I'm very happy to look back at the successful development of our office for over 11 years now, and I'm even more looking forward to the years to come. Having said that, I'm turning um, over back to Eva. Enjoy the talk. Thank you very much, Christiane. I would now like to welcome Jörg Schumacher, Executive Director of the Goethe Institute, New York. Thank you very much, dear Eva. Thanks and hi to Christiane. Welcome, Matthias and Jobina. It's a pleasure to meet you here and it's an honor to be part of this wonderful transatlantic tandem sessions. Um, it's not too late to congratulate you to your 10th anniversary, which was the start of the series, but I know that the number 11 has a specific meaning for everybody related to Cologne. And I can proudly say it's like I'm, a, um, I'm part of the alumni network of University Cologne myself, uh, graduating uh, in, uh, from the Department of History in 2001. Today and from the Goethe Institute, I would just like to throw in like another perspective on the topic of trust. It's like um, uh, we as a cultural center, as the official cultural center of the Federal Republic of Germany, I can tell that trust 
is the currency that we do work with in the field of foreign cultural policy. So the standard definition maybe is like the basic thing that a Goethe Institute should do in a foreign country, uh, and that's also what we do with six institutes here in the US, is gain and support trust between the two countries and the host country and Germany it's like that we that we work with. What do we do it's like in the field it's like of gaining trust? It's like, and what do we, what does the Goethe Institute do? It's like, I'm sure some of you are familiar with it and with our work, it's like, but it basically ranges it's like from uh, several language activities we do first, we do foster German language activities as we do, it's like organized independently, um, uh, all kinds of cultural activities in the fields of arts, ranging from exhibitions, theater performances to literature events. I was researching if we did something on the topic of trust here in the US before, and like on the concise topic of trust, this again, as I said, this like a, I think generally all of our work does. Um, but I came across one thing is like that we participate with as an institute here in the US, a second that will take place in the next year, 2023, and that's the International Symposium on Trust, which will happen in May in Weimar. So the name of the symposium is the Kultur Symposium in Weimar. It's its fourth edition, and the Goethe Institute will invite um, many interdisciplinary artists, research, researchers, scientists, it's like performers, it's like a, to contribute to that very question. It's like a, and the basic assumption is, it's like that as a society could not sustain without trust, without trust in private and in business relations, in political systems, in law, in media, in information, international treaties, technology, um, but also currency, and not last but not least, it's like also trust in ourselves. I have good trust for today that we will have a stimulating discussion. I would like to thank the University of Cologne office for setting this up. And without further ado, I'll hand it back to Eva, and thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Jörg. Now, before we continue with the actual presentation, I would like to tell you a little bit about our speakers. With us today is Jabina Gonzalez, Senior Vice President for HR for the South Americas region in Boston. Jabina is a global HR leader with over 20 years of management experience across Asia, Europe, and the Americas. She holds global HR certifications, a graduate diploma in human capital management, and is a certified strength finder coach. Jobina will tell us about her experience as someone who works in management and HR today, and as someone who believes in empowering people and motivating them to optimize their potential. But first, we will hear from Matthias Heinz, Professor for Strategy at the University of Cologne. In his research, Matthias studies the effects of management practices on workers' performance and behavior, and the performance of companies in randomized control trial studies. His research has been published in leading management and economics journals, such as the American Economic Review, and this year he received the prestigious European Research Council's starting grant. Congratulations, Matthias. He is also spokesperson of the Research Cluster of Excellence eContribute, Markets and Public Policy by the Universities Bonn and Cologne, funded by the German Research Foundation DFK. You might ask yourself, that's great, but what is a research cluster of excellence? It is the hub for excellence research in, excellent research in Germany and part of an initiative called the Excellence Strategy, which is a program by the German federal government to strengthen cutting edge research at German universities. Currently, 57 clusters of excellence at universities across Germany are funded as part of the Excellence Strategy four of them at the University of Cologne. The cluster e-contribute that we are featuring today with Matthias is, remarkably, the only cluster of excellence in economics. It conducts research on markets at the intersections of economy, policy, and society. It aims it to apply a new approach to understanding markets and find innovative solutions for market failures in times of social, technological, and economic challenges. Matthias's research is part of the research area Organizational Design and Behavior, which is concerned with the design of management practices and motivation. We are very excited to hear about your research at the cluster, Matthias, 
as well as comments on it from your practical experience, uh, Jobina. And with this, I would like to hand over to our moderator, Julia Helms, from uh, the German Center of Research and Innovation, DWIH New York. Over to you, Julia. Thank you so much. So before we hand it over to Matthias for the main section of our events, there's three technical details that I would like to give you so that you can have the best experience on the WebEx. The first is the bottom left hand of your screen, if you are on a desktop computer, you can enable closed captioning if, for example, English is not your first language. So you can enable that, clicking the small CC button on the bottom left of your screen. During the presentation, we will be asking you two poll questions. Those poll questions will automatically open your window if you were on your window, if you were joining us on a desktop. Those will be on the right side of your screen, and then we encourage and ask you to participate in those poll questions. If you are on a cell phone, you will see a notice that a Slido poll is open, and you can click that button to participate in the poll on your mobile device. Lastly, after both presentations, we are having a Q&A with both presenters, and we would love to get your questions. To submit a question, the bottom right of your screen on a desktop, there is a little question mark button and it has a Q&A function. To submit a question, type in your question, submit it to all co-hosts, and we will be able to pass those along to the presenters. With that, I am pleased to hand over the virtual stage to Matthias Heinz. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much for the very kind introduction and greetings from uh, from the evening here in Cologne. Um, it's really a pleasure to present here at the University of Cologne in New York today. And um, yeah, thanks a lot. I'm looking forward to all kind of uh, comments and discussions here. And saying this, um, can you share my slides then? Yeah, and um, so the main topic for today is trust and control. Trust is trust is good, control is better, or is the other way around? Control is good, trust is better. So basically, it's about finding the right balance between the two things. And um, when you think about um, what, what basically um, various situations that we have every day, there are loads of situations in our daily life where we actually are confronted with the decision, should we trust or should we control or should we trust a bit, control a bit or trust a lot or control a lot. Let me just give you two examples. Um, for example, should we trust our children to make their homework or should we just control it? Do they, they do their homework? Should we, in the traffic, when the traffic lights are green, should we just trust when we tr um, that no, that all cars will stop when we cross the street, or should we better control it? Or also, as a company, you have the same kind of trade-off: should you trust your workers that they actually work hard and do their job, basically, or should we control them? And that's the basic kind of trade-offs that we have quite often in our life. And now, please, the next slide, please. What a second next. So trust is good, control is better, finding the right balance. What do researchers say? And here we have the researchers practice basically, in particular from research in economics and management. And um, basically in research, you can say the researchers are kind of split here. There are kind of two groups. One group is more like saying trust is good. The other group says more like control is good. And the question is who is, what is really better at the end? Let me just um, phrase the key arguments from the two groups. So on the one hand, we have a group that basically says you should trust your workers because, well, when you monitor workers, when you control them, you have con uh, costs because of the technology. And also when you um, control your, when you trust your workers and don't control them, your workers and yourself have more time for other activities, basically. Or a second point, which is raised quite often as well, when you usually people, particular employees in this case, dislike being monitored. Why, would they, why do they dislike it? Well, it's a signal of mistrust when you control someone. And also you can't goof around basically when you are controlled all the time. This is kind of the argument why people actually, why researchers say we should trust workers. On the other hand, there are also research um, strengths that basically says you should control your workers. One famous book is, um, uh, is about, um, about checklists from the US, this is a, a very popular book here. And this book basically is it's mainly driven by, um, by, by someone who's working in hospitals. And this person says actually in argues quite extensively, we have to control people. We have to use checklists all the time to make sure that people do their job basically. 
And also um, there is something that is called the World Management Survey, which is basically one of the leading um, surveys around the world about management practices. And here actually several questions are about monitoring and monitoring is something which is defined as the best way to actually handle, to, to handle your workers, to steer your workers basically. And also there are some studies, at least some of them, that actually find when you um, introduce checklists that you have positive effects on the, um, on the performance of the workers. And when we go to the next slide, we actually, um, in this next slide, please. <laughs> and um, actually this discussion between trust versus control that we have in research, um, we actually had exactly the same discussion with a bakery chain. So um, we have in this project, I would like to present here, three years ago, we had the first meetings of the company and we had exactly the same discussions here. And basically you could actually split the company top management in two groups. The first group of top managers said, we have to trust our workers because when we trust them, they have more time for customers because they have less kind of, they waste less time with filling out paperwork, documentation duties and so on. And also this, the, the workers, these kind of groups of top managers said, well, when you, when you um, control your workers and you don't trust them, the employees might be demotivated, which is bad for the performance. On the other hand, the other type of managers based in the company said, you have to control workers because this signals the workers what they have to do, basically give them structure and guidance, how they should do their job. If we don't control them, they might goof around, they might not work hard. And also um, when, you, um, when you control workers with paperwork, you indirectly tell them how to do their job and this helps them to coordinate basically, how to deal with customers that actually all people in the company, for example, deal in the same way with customers. So we had exactly the same discussion that we have in research also in this bakery chain. And this bakery chain is owned by a family and the um, father of the family is the CEO, the son is the COO, and actually they had the same discussion within the family. So the son was more like on the trust side, the father was more on the control side, and also they basically were discussing here quite intensively about trust versus control. So it's actually always kind of the same story here, trust versus control, what is the right balance. And on the next slide, actually, we have here a research project where we study exactly this question. So the company that we're actually cooperating here is a large family-owned bakery chain from Germany. It has around 2,000 workers in 145 bakeries, and it's really like one of these traditional German bakeries that I think many of us or most of us um, have seen to some extent. And the company in 2018 conducted a large employee survey, and then this employee survey turned out that the workers in the company are highly dissatisfied with the control-oriented culture and um, the paperwork duties in the company. So basically what the workers said is that they monitored all the time with paperwork, um, by the management, and this is something that workers really didn't like, and they, they, and they basically complained about this. Then actually we met with the, we as a research team met with the top management of the company, and we discussed about the pros and cons of monitoring, basically of controlling the workers. And at the end, actually our decision was, well, to find out actually what is the right balance between trust and control, we should just run a randomized control trial and check which effect basically is larger the effect of trust or the effect of control. And that's actually helps us to see whether what is better on average and also in which kind of bakeries is which kind of um, type of um, management here better. And that's where our research project started. And well, at the start of the project, what we did actually, we um, identified all the kind of paperwork duties that, um, that the workers actually had in different stores. So basically we came up a list with more than 20 different kinds of documentation duties and paperwork in the company actually here. And um, following that, we conducted in-depth, in-person surveys with the employees in the bakery. So basically as a researcher team, we went to the bakeries and interviewed the workers to and showed them actually a list of all these documentation duties and asked them basically for each of the documentation duties, what are the costs, what are the benefits? In particular, we asked them to what extent does the duty help the company to achieve a soul, its goals, which is more like the benefit of this situation duty. On the other hand, we asked them, how often do you fill out this paperwork duty each week and how many minutes does it take each time? And based on this kind of, what you see in this figure here, you see here on the, um, uh, you see here basically agreeability to what extent do people agree that this helps us to um, achieve the goal, but also the time is kind of the cost of this thing. So how much time does it each time cost to actually fill out this documentation to do or to fill it out each week basically. 
And as you can see on the right side, basically we have documentation duties, so paperwork duties in the company, which have not, let's say, the best um, ben um, cost benefit ratio. And among these five um, documentation duties, so each dot is here one documentation duties, we have three blue ones here actually, and it turned out that those basically are holy cows. Actually, here the top management told us we really need them, even if the benefits, the cost benefit ratios are the best. But the two other ones, the two red ones, those were the ones actually we started discussing with the company. Do we really need them, or should we not, we not just? Conduct and randomized control, try and experiment basically where we omit these, where we drop these documentation to these in random circuit stores and test the effects of them. Next slide. And um, here we have in the next slide the two documentation duties, and those are called daily protocol and operational checklists. So the left um, side, the daily protocol, is actually a protocol where people actually document basically their daily work. They basically write in this documentation duty here um, um, their, um, how much cash they generated on a day, how much should be in the cash return, how much money and how much money is there. Is there a difference basically where the product sold out on a specific, a specific day, whether any shift changes or anything else? And this is um, something which workers find time consuming. It takes a lot of time each week, but they did not basically um, humili didn't find it humiliating or they didn't find it annoying, basically. But it is a quite costly document in terms of time. On the right side, we see the operation checklist. And this is something actually which is not that time consuming, but workers find it really annoying and workers find it also really humiliating. What is this about? So basically on this operation checklist, the workers basically are asked to sign every day specific things that they do in a store. For example, they have to sign every day that they know the COVID hotline. So this is operation checklist from December 2020, and this actually changed actually every couple of months. Or we had one checklist that workers had to sign that they smile at the customers. So basically every day they had to sign that they don't forget to smile at the customers when they sell something to the customer. Or here, what you also see here on the checklist, we have things like the Christmas cookies, are they placed in the right way? Are they sold out? And um, or the last point here is the coffee bag. So actually workers had to sign, they're reminded basically by the management, when you want to actually sell coffee, first use the old coffee bags before you actually open a new one. And that's actually what workers have to sign every day. Or my favorite is the one here in the middle, the one in yellow. And this is actually also, it actually was in the original document, but it's also in yellow. So basically here it says, Please be mindful about the appearance of the Berliner Donuts. In a recent store visit, the sugar was partly scrapped off on one side of the Berliner. So actually what happened here is the CEO of the company has a big Mercedes and he drove with his Mercedes to a store. And in a store, he discovered that on one of the Berliner Donuts, actually the sugar was scrapped on the side because an employee touched it with his hands. And after that, actually, all workers for the following months had to sign every day on this operation checklist that they make sure that they basically touch the Berliner Donut in the right way. Because they had to carefully touch the Berliner Donut with a cake tongue on the side and never touch the Berliner Donut with a cake tongue on the top. And also workers had to sign that they actually make sure that they monitor whether there are any other reasons why actually sugar is scrapped off the Berliner Donuts. So this is really an original document here. And that's basically how the company wants to monitor and show the workers actually how they actually have to do their job basically here. And that's something that people find really humiliating in our company and where it seems to be some kind of behavioral cost, you could call this, um, to have this documentation duty here. Next slide. So what we did in our experiment, actually we randomly selected 73 stores and in those stores actually for nine months, we just dropped these two documents. We just removed them basically for nine months and run a, a pilot study. And then the remaining 70 stores, we didn't change anything. And we communicated this to the workers that we tell them we trust you and we encourage you to use the extra time for customers. Next slide. And now we come to the two short survey questions. Um, should I say that? Yeah, so sure. the first question yeah. is, how will the sales, so how will the performance of the stores develop in which this documentation duties were removed? So we compare two groups. One group, we have basically the, um, the treatment in which we remove the documentation duties. And the other group, actually, nothing changed. So how will the sales and the treatment group where we remove this documentation duties develop? So will the average effect of removing this documentation duties and trusting people more 
be positive, negative, or stay constant will increase the sales, decrease, or stay the same. So we see some votes coming in. Please continue to vote. We'll give you like another 20 seconds. Last five seconds to submit your vote. Okay, interesting. Thanks a lot. So basically half of the people say it will increase, one third say it will um, stay the same, and 15% say um, it will decrease. Thanks a lot. Then the second question on the next slide. So now the spoiler, in some of the bakeries, the sales will indeed increase. And now the question is, in which type of the bakeries was this indeed the case, or is this the case? So basically in which type of the bakeries did the performance indeed increase? For example, did it increase in the bigger or in the smaller ones? Did it increase in teams that were younger or older? Was it bad or versus good performing stores? So any kind of ideas where this actually work quite well to trust the people. Just type your answer in the chat here, the text box. Take another 10 seconds to submit your answer. Okay, thanks. So what do we find? We find small shops, old workers, small shops, young, good performing ones in bakeries of your senior, well experienced staff. Okay, small stores. Yeah, okay. So um, reciprocal preferences. Okay, small stores. So basically everyone thinks about small stores here. Yeah, good performing stores. Yeah, so basically I would say the general impression is that it depends a lot on tenure. Um, the size of the stores and how good the stores are actually performing. Thanks a lot. Then let's come to the results. The next slide, please. Then. So what is the average effect of the um, uh, uh, that we find on performance here? Next slide. So the average effect actually we find here in the regression framework is when we remove the two paperwork duties, the sales increase by between two and 3%. So basically what you find is on average, um, the sales increase by two to 3% when you actually trust people more and monitor them less here in our company. At the same time, also number of customer visits um, increased by two to 3%. Um, well, the effect is not such significant, but it points to a very similar direction here. So. Overall, it seems actually that the average effect here is positive and indeed 50% um, said, yes, it will actually increase. So indeed we find the increase in sales for turnover for the personnel turnover, we'll find no average effect, but actually find that the store manager turnover decrease in the company. Then the next question is um, the sales increase on average, but which stores are driving the results? And what we find actually here is so what we conducted um, at the before we actually um, start with the RCT, we asked the regional managers in the company. So we have regional managers and each of them basically is managing 10 stores. Um, for each of their stores, will the actually effect be positive or negative in the store? So basically what we asked them is um, the same question that I asked you a couple of minutes ago about the average effect. I asked them basically for st store number one in of your stores, Will it, will it work or will it not work? Store number two, will it work or will it not work? And so on, basically, for each single store, basically. What we find is for the stores where the managers actually said in those stores it will work, we find that the sales increased by five percentage points. For those stores where the manager thought it won't work, we find a zero effect, basically, of the experiment. So what it actually seems is that the regional managers, they basically know which workers and which teams you can trust, but they also know which ones you should not trust, actually, and where you actually need some kind of control here. And also the reduction of turnover manager turnover is also concentrated in those stores. Then the next slide. Um, uh, 
Next slide, please. The next slide is actually how can these predictions be explained? Well, what we observe is actually those predictions are not correlated with any kind of observable store characteristics or steam characteristics. But what we also see is that when regional managers actually say it will not work, the main reason, reason is some people need guidance and structure. So basically what I said is when you don't control people, when you don't monitor them, it will be chaos in the store, basically. On the other hand, in the stores where the regional managers thought it will work, they argued those people are some that you actually can trust, they will actually like it, have not to pay, not have less paperwork, they will have less stress, they know the procedures, they don't need guidance, basically they will manage it and um, without these lists here. Next slide. And um, then actually a further result about which stores are driving results, basically here, we also find a larger effect in smaller stores. So basically exactly what you anticipate a couple of minutes ago and um, what we actually found out in our survey is it seems that people use the paperwork to coordinate themselves. And in small stores, basically, you have direct communication. So when I have a store with three people and one is work, one worker is working in the morning, one is working in the afternoon, they use this daily protocol to communicate between the first and the second shift, basically, what are the most important things you have to know. And in small stores, this is basically not needed because you can communicate directly with your coworker. In big teams with 20 workers or so, this is not possible because not all workers talk to all other workers all the time. And that actually seems to be quite good actually to have paperwork to coordinate better. Second um, effect we find here is we find a larger effect in those stores basically um, when we remove the, uh, remove the documentation to this year, that were performing well in the past. So basically those stores that were running well, those stores you can trust, those stores that were not going, um, were not going so well, those stores actually, um, um, we did not find any effects here. Next slides. Um, what is the mechanism of this result? So basically there could be two potential explanations. The first one is it could be a direct effect. So employees have more time and because of that, they simply can work, uh, look after more customers because they have more time. Or it could be an indirect effect because it's a signal of trust. You basically workers value, workers like actually, they love it actually to be less controlled. And because of that, they work harder in our company basically. What do we find? Well, we find two pieces of evidence that speak against the direct effect. And the first one is, so what we know is actually, we know at which type, time of the day, people usually fill out the paperwork. What we observe is actually in our experiment is that in those hours, the sales effect are exactly the same like in the other hours. So basically in those hours, actually, where people kind of save time at what time of the day, they actually have the same effect to our experiment as in the hour, other hours where they did not save any time. And second, we know how much time actually workers spend in the shops um, on average um, to fill out these documentation duties. And we have some shops who did all the paperwork within two or three minutes, but we also have shops who actually needed 60 to 70 minutes to fill out the paperwork. But for those types of shop, the effect of the RCT is exactly the same. So we don't actually observe any differences, which means that actually shops that save more time because of less paperwork, for those shops you find the same effect as in those shops actually that save um, less time here. And following that actually, the next slide, um, when we actually presented these results to the company, the company was quite happy about this and given the success, they rolled it out actually and introduced the paperwork reduction in the whole company in end of January, 2022. We don't have the results yet for this period, but we are just receiving the data from the company about this. So let me conclude what is actually, what are the takeaways here? Um, trust versus control, what is the right balance? Well, in our company here, we eliminate, eliminated control-oriented paperwork duties in a large RCT. So the company was a bakery chain. We find on average a positive effect. So on average, the sales increase and also the customer visits. So it seems that people work kind of faster in the company. More customers came in. You could actually sell more bread to customers because you had more customers. But also, but, and, it, and we also observed that actually this seems to be driven by the fact that People see it as a, as a bad sign when actually it's a bad signal when their manager um, controls them because it's actually a sign of, uh, of, of mistrust here. But this is an average effect. The average effect is on sales is positive, but also we find a lot of difference between groups of workers. And one group is here, and one important fact is here, um, we see that in smaller teams, actually the effect is larger. 
which indicate when one product explanations that the communication is easier when a team is small, it's easier to communicate. We observe that in well performing teams, you don't need control basically. So the basically the teams that are already doing quite well, you don't have to control them. You can trust them that they will do their job basically. While those teams that are not doing that well, those teams it might be more useful actually to control here. And finally, the manager seems to know a lot about this. So actually what we observe is that the teams where the management knows that those are actually teams that can manage it. And actually those are people that you can actually trust in those teams. We also find larger effect here. So the end, you should also to some extent ask your manager. The managers usually know which kind of the teams where you can trust and which are the teams that you maybe need more control. Thanks a lot. That's all I wanted to say here today, and I'm looking forward to any discussion. In particular, I'm looking forward to now the um, talk from Eubenia. Thanks so much, Matthias. So we're going to hand it over to Jobina for her practical expertise. Thank you, Julia, and thank you, Matthias. That was really, really insightful. I mean, uh, it was so nice to see uh, how well trust works and at the same time, how important the manager input is because he knows the team best. Um, coming from my experience uh, in a corporate world, I find that uh, teams which uh, are in the beginning stage, what we call the norming stage, the control works because people need some guidance on how uh, work is structured. So control where the structure uh, is being put in place works well. Once the structure is put in place and understood by the team members and they've reached a, a phase where they are performing, trust works better. I was looking at the uh, camera when uh, Matthias was sh sharing the highlighted yellow part about the form that people have to fill in about the sugar getting scraped off. And I saw a lot of people nodding their heads and shaking their heads because this is how it feels like if you if you are in school, if you are in university, if you are at work or even if you're at home, if you have constant control about things which seem very basic or very easy to understand and somebody is expecting you to put a tick that you have done it, I think it makes you feel mistrusted. It makes you feel that somebody is patronizing you. And I think that is exactly the feeling also in corporate environments. Too much of control, uh, too much of micromanagement drives people away. And um, when we do our employee uh, exit surveys, when people uh, resign and decide to move, one of the factors that comes up very often is that uh, I didn't have the autonomy to do the job that I signed up for. So there are people who are experienced, who are tenured, and you've hired them because they are experienced, because they fit the bill. And when you hire them to do the job, but you still want to tell them how to do the job, it is not appreciated. So um, it's a very thin balance, I feel. Uh, you can't do without one or the other. It's very situational. It depends on the maturity of the team formation. Uh, it depends on the leadership style. There are leaders who believe that control is important because that makes them feel that they're doing their jobs, whereas it's not always true. I think sometimes trusting your people because you hired them for exact same purpose that they would do the job is far more important. And I think uh, th this is also in the corporate environment where you strike a balance between when you trust and when you control. Though more and more studies these days are leaning towards trust because uh, with COVID, we had a lot of people starting to work remotely. Uh, US was always uh, remote, I think. There had a lot of uh, cases where people worked remotely part, to, part of the week. It was not so common in the rest of the world. And suddenly managers could not see their people in office. They could not see if they are online. They could not see if they are logging in their time. And that required a lot of mindset changes for the managers because then you have to trust that people are at home and are doing the work. It brought a lot of uncomfortable feeling for some managers because they're used to presentism. They're used to checking in on people. Uh, did he take uh, more than four coffee breaks in a day? Did he take the required time in the lunch? It made them very uncomfortable because now employees were struggling with managing working from home, taking care of their children, the childcare is closed, helping remote learning for some of their school going children. How do you trust your employees that they're still putting in their best? And most employees feel very valued when there was nobody checking on them during COVID. 
when they were told that deliverables matter, not how you get to them. So if you're busy some part of the day because your little toddler cannot log in remotely, but you're able to deliver what you need to do when the toddler is taking a nap and your manager is okay with it, it was so much more appreciated. So I'm looking forward to some discussion as well, but uh, very insightful uh, research, Matthias. Uh, always uh, nice to hear you because you're so passionate about the topic as well. It comes through when you're presenting. So thank you and uh, looking forward to some questions. Thank you so much, Jabina, for sharing your insights. For those of you listening, this is the time that we're, oh, love it. There's already a question here. Um, so this is your time to utilize the Q&A button, and you'll find that at the bottom right of your screen if you're on a desktop. If you're using a mobile device, it's an ellipsis. There's three buttons, and then you can submit your question that way. Um, I also see that someone's raised a hand. Uh, let's try to keep all the questions in the Q&A if we can, um, but otherwise we'll try to get to it as soon as we can. So the first question that I have here from the audience, um, and it seems like it's a two-part question. So Let's give it a go. Would a task based approach complement the balance between control versus trust? So, for example, clearly lay out tasks for a team with a reasonable timeline and expect benchmarks and sufficiently and timely support that. So, I think just basically to sum up, is there a way that we can use this notion of and control? Um, to complement that with basically very specific tasks. And I don't know who wants to go first, if we should have Martina, Matthias or Jabina go. Matthias can start to... and then I'll chime in. Or sh shall I start and then you, okay, all right, yeah. thanks. I, I think uh, putting outlining a task is also kind of a control in my opinion, but uh, setting expectation in terms of the outcome I think that is where you trust the employee to reach the outcome in the way that they find the most suitable and most efficient way. Uh, when you have too many uh, criteria that need to be fulfilled, whether it is uh, the milestone or whether a tracking system or a toolkit, you are actually trying to control. And that's my opinion. So I think having a more uh, guardrail uh, for an outcome is far more trustworthy than actually laying it out because that's kind of a control. But that's my view. Matthias, what do you think? Yeah, I would also agree. So, um, so, so in this in this environment that we have here in the bakery chain, that is, I mean, people have additionally these kind of milestones and additionally have these targets basically all the time. But additionally, the company also controls them um, and, and quite harshly. So in a way, they use this already additionally here in our company. Yeah, but I'm also agree with you, Bina. So at the end, it's also kind of a control when you give these kind of uh, targets. You just don't control, you just control basically the outcomes, but not that much the process. Um, but I also would say it's kind of an interesting question, actually, what people like more or less, actually. So it could be that actually people perceive when they are, when the procedures are controlled, they perceive it as less or a, a, a more negative compared to when the outcomes are controlled. Yeah, but also I can say so. So I know from my personal experience, you talk to people um, in, in firms, I also experience quite often that people are actually scared when the outcomes are controlled, because sometimes you can't influence the outcomes. When, you are, when your process is controlled, you actually know what you do and you can show what you do and your manager sees what you did. But at the end, sometimes you can just have bad luck and the outcome is really bad of something because just no customers came, for example, to your bakery. And in this case, actually, when your milestones and your output is controlled, this can even be more negative for you and people might not like this here. So it's it's a fine balance here. Thanks for the question. So one of the things that you presented in your study, Matthias, is that the bakery chain implemented the change across all different stores, even the ones, for example, that were not that were larger stores or where the managers had not predicted that it would be as effective. Are there ways of adopting both policies so saying this is a small store so we're going to give them more trust less control and for the larger stores will operate more control so within a company is it possible to kind of play both to to utilize both at the same time yeah that's an excellent question i mean so when i present the results to the company i'd execute this discussion with the firm basically i said so in a way this this highlights you should actually control some people but trust other people and they were kind of skeptical about this because they said well 
in a way, we want to treat all people the same. We don't might don't want to just differentiate here. They are also kind of curious what Yubina thinks about it. But it's kind of hard to treat people totally different in the company. What actually what I said at the end, well, in a way, what you could do, you could treat everyone the same, but take each month of the worst performing stores and control them more in the following months. In a way, this is then something where you really focus on those ones where you know that they need the control. And that's also something where you can actually explain to the people why you have to trust, why you compared to a control some. But I think with the small versus big stores, I don't know whether you can explain this to people in a good way where people would agree, yes, I have, I need more control or yes, I need more trust. Yeah, I, I, I can also add to that, that uh, it's really situational because I could give example of my team. If I have an intern who's uh, fresh out of uh, college or still studying, they need more direction because they've never worked in a corporate environment. And if I use my uh, usual leadership style where I say, oh, I will not micromanage you, you figure out your own projects, I'm not helping them in the internship because they don't know what they don't know. So for them, more direction, more control, uh, even the way about uh, professional etiquettes in terms of how do you check in? How often do you check in? Do you update uh, regularly or just key milestone? That helps them with their internship so they're prepared for the corporate life. But if I have an employee who's 20 years a veteran in this field, if I'm checking every morning with that employee, hey, what are you planning to do today? And what are you doing after lunch? Can you imagine how frustrated that employee would be? So it is really very situational. Um, I believe that control for structure is important where communication lapses happen because, again, all employees are human beings and some are more structured in their communication and some are not. So putting a structure in place probably helps more, but then at least give them the flexibility to achieve their goals in the way that they can within the guardrails. You still have to function as a corporate. You can't just have everybody running free that I'll work on Sunday evening when there's nobody else talking to me. So it doesn't work that way either. It's still a corporate environment. Yeah, that's also what I would say. So the management said the same in our company. It said some people need structure. You can't leave them alone. They, I mean, one one manager compared it to some kind of yeah. To they basically said it will end up in total chaos in this shop. Actually, no one will work anything at the end. It will be totally dirty. There will be no customers. It will be a total mess. And and it's yeah, I totally agree at this point. Yeah. I'm also really curious, Matthias. You mentioned that this is a family-owned business, and that the within the family there was distinctions between what the father would like to implement and the opinions of his son. To what extent is this debate generational? Yeah, it's a good point. So in this case, um, I'm actually, it could be generation. I'm not probably sure about this because also the, 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 the father basically set up this whole company and he had this experience to control people because he was in a family owned business always means kind of when, when someone steals something or someone does basically shirks or or goofs around basically this immediately means that it, you lose as a family money basically and i think this basically he had probably loads of bad experience over the last 30 40 50 years with this and maybe this actually changed his mind basically maybe it was different when he was younger compared to nowadays but this might change basically shift your opinions about trust versus control but the son kind of was um, he had studied basically and had some kind of consulting experience before he came back into the, the, the family owned company. But yeah, I don't know. Maybe in 30 years, he would have the same opinion like his father. So it could be generation driven, but it could also be education. It could also be different experiences. So I'm, I'm not sure, but yeah, it's a, it's an interesting point. Yeah. Um, Jabina, you've experienced working in India and in Singapore and in the U S and your team that you have now is working across multiple different countries. So for you, have you experienced cultural preferences when it comes to leadership style on both the level of management and the employee? Yes, most definitely. I think uh, by far, even uh, as you asked the question about generation, there is a generational element as well that uh, the amount of flexibility that employees crave changes from time to time. My parents, I mean, my dad liked control because that made sure that he felt he was contributing to the company but i'm sure my siblings who are younger than me probably don't appreciate that much so that does change the culture has evolved uh, over the years and over the generations uh, across geographical cultures uh, what i feel is that uh, there is an inherent level of uh, corporate norm that is accepted or that is practiced so my co-workers in germany would have a norm where uh, 
they probably would not be okay to work after 6 p.m. or 5 p.m. because they have a very clear differentiation between personal and professional life. Uh, whereas my co-workers in Asia would be okay to do that provided they can take a day off later sometime. So it's really depending. There's a lot of cultural uh, context to this uh, whole equation. But by far, uh, I was just thinking of an example when Matthias was answering that a lot of our startups in US have started uh, offering unlimited vacation. So you don't really need to track your leave. You can take your vacation whenever you want. And that is being sold as a very good perk to new candidates that you want to hire in your organization. Try implementing that in a bigger organization or an organization which has infrastructure in place where people need to report to work like a laboratory. Can you have all your engineers suddenly deciding, hey, I don't feel like working today and I'm going to take a day off. And then what happens to the testing that needs to be done? So some structure is required, I feel. Uh, and also the element of allowing flexibility with unlimited vacation time is that the chances of somebody misusing is still lesser than the majority of the population. So people in general are given the benefit of doubt that you would not misuse and very few that would misuse would still be okay for the organization to not feel the impact. But can you have everybody just deciding not to work from uh, 15th of the December because it's the time to pause and reflect and then you have all your laboratory scrolls or your clients are calling you because their work doesn't stop. They're depending on you. So I think there is this th thin line that you always need to balance uh, between what works. Uh, culturally, even every organization differs. It's very top down. Um, the family run business, the CEO has seen it and he's probably had uh, uh, burnt his fingers a couple of times where somebody took advantage of it and that defined his leadership style. Whereas his son, who's probably uh, in a different generation, he would like to have a more modern, approachable, flexible kind of uh, way. And you have to find a balance because experience also counts. So. Thank you so much. We have a question from the audience that touches on a new topic slightly. So from Kelly. Hi, I was curious, but what are your thoughts on perceived control in conjunction with trust and control? As in the person believes and trusts that they have complete control over something like their online data, but really they do not. Yeah, it's an interesting point. I'm not sure whether it's that easy to implement something like this in a firm. At least in a German firm, I would say it's difficult because when you control people, you kind of have to inform them or they will know about it. Or you also have the workers council who might check this. So I'm, but maybe in the US, this is easier to do something like this. <laughs> but in German, it, it sounds interesting, but I'm not sure why this would work in Germany with the workers rights and the workers representation in firms. So I'm not sure I got the question right if it was meant in the corporate context, but yeah, perception is for the most part also reality. I mean, people see the world in the lens that they are wearing. So uh, if they perceive that they are in control, but there's always a big brother watching it. Uh, recently, there was an article about how uh, one of the big five in the IT, I don't know if it's Google or Microsoft, tried to see how often people were online on their uh, organizational chats to see if they are productive because this whole flexibility of uh, work from anywhere and all was taking a toll on the productivity. So now is that a wrong decision on their part that they are trusting people to do um, in US? One other thing that has happened during COVID is people with given flexibility to work remotely have started taking on more than one jobs because you're remote. So you don't know whether you're working here or there and they're taking multiple jobs. Now, is that fair to an employer? I don't think so. So I think there are a lot of uh, nuances to this about how the modern workplace has changed uh, during COVID or post COVID. And I think if you perceive that you have the autonomy to do your job the way you want and you think you're in control, but there's always like a next level or a skip level watching over the output so I'm always linking it to the output because I am not a firm believer of checking on somebody day in and day out, but really the deliverables that you have hired the person for. I think that's a fair expectation and employer, employers also have a duty towards earning the sales and the revenue for the company and making the company profitable. So there has to be a balance sometimes. 
Thank you so much. And this is a follow up from another um, viewer, sort of on the similar lens of thinking specifically about remote versus in person work and specifically thinking about the kind of monitoring that can be done in each situation. Here, the question is specifically about a college staff. So in what, uh, to what instance would uh, remote or in-person be better when we're looking at a college? So maybe to, re maybe to reframe this question, Matthias, you're looking at an environment where it's very important that people are coming in in person. If they're baking the bread, if they're baking the rolls, this is not something that can be happening remotely. And as long as it's not automated yet, you need those people to come in in person. It's also a very physical environment. So when you're thinking about this particular study, can it be applied to other environments as well? And for example, thinking maybe of a college or we're thinking of school, nobody really wants to send their child to virtual daycare. So how do your findings translate, translate um, to other environments where in-person work might be very important? Yeah, so yeah, no, that's an interesting question. So, so just to give you one example where we had exactly, um, well, the discussion how to do this was exams during COVID times because that we also have to control the students don't cheat but this is quite difficult because it's it's difficult to do this on a computer so at the end what i did before my exam i told the students that they have to turn the, the zoom camera on that i can see them all the time but right one minute before the exam i said no this was a trick you don't have to do this and and we just trust that you do this right and when we ask so many questions with pressure on students, they don't have the time actually to um, to actually cheat on the way. But at the end, I, I couldn't control it because you can't really control people remotely. You can do this to some extent with IT systems where they see actually how many emails they write and, and or something like this. Uh, but at the end, this is kind of, yeah, that you're indirectly forced to trust. So going back to the more general question about the environment here, I mean, I, I don't really know actually where we can transfer this results here in this one bakery chain to a kind of all kind of situations on the world. I think this is more like we, we see here in depth in which situations this work. And I think small versus big teams, well versus bad performing teams for the managers um, say and, and, and do or know about their teams. This is something which I would actually believe this we would also find in other um, other um, situations around the world and also Eubina's experiment seems to be at least to some extent in line or to a large extent in line with this year. And that's also my experience, what I uh, have as with communicating with colleagues here. But at the end, yeah, in, in such a project, you never actually know where you can transfer it one to one to a different environment. But I would say, yes, the environment is, is, is it's slightly, we will find them similar. Also note, this is bakeries are part of a retail business. And when you think about retail, this is the biggest kind of industry on the world. We have 10% of the world population works in retail and they have kind of similar, not the same, but similar jobs like that we have here in our bakery chain. Um, and sort of Jabina, thinking about your experience, do current coworkers of yours or employees in the company have the possibility for hybrid work or remote work? Are there certain positions within your organization where that is not allowed or not possible given the duties that they have? I'd be curious to get your input on this question as well. Yes, we, we were successful in implementing what we call the future of work model uh, last summer, so summer of 2021. Uh, what we did is we reclassified all the roles that we had in the organization uh, based on the workplace intensity that is required. So there were certain roles, like for example, as I mentioned in the laboratory, you need an engineer to switch on that uh, testing equipment. So those are on site where they're expected to be in office. Uh, the, most of the corporate support roles are hybrid where you are expected twice a week. Uh, there are also some corporate roles which are uh, remote because you didn't find the right candidate in the site that you're operating in. So then you hired somebody from a different state where there is no office, so they're remote. Most of our inspectors and auditors in our company, they are usually at the client side. So when they are not at the client side, they are at home because they are traveling. So they have been classified as remote. So we have three distinct categories and the expectation is there that you would be there. Of course, managers, like for me, I come four times a week because then I at least get to see my employees once. Whoever comes on Monday, I see them on Monday. Who comes on Thursday, I see them on Thursday. So for me, I come four times a week and it helps. And there was a nice question there because you can achieve a lot by being remote. I'm not saying that you're not productive when you're remote, but just the whole social fabric, the water cooler conversation, the checking in on people, 
uh, talking about things, talking about family, talking about children, even if you're just passing by in the office are so important and we should not underestimate the impact of that having on the culture of the organization. So uh, today we have our office Christmas event in the afternoon and I'm very sure there'll be some people that I've never seen because they've always been remote. So uh, it, it really helps to at least see them once in a while, even if you're just coming for meetings. And I think we have successfully done that by implementing the future of work model last year. Well, thank you so much for sharing with that. I see that we are at time. So again, Matthias, Jobina, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. And thank you for all the audience members for taking time out of your day to be here. For those of you who do celebrate December 6th and Nicolas, wishing you all a wonderful Nicolas and have a great holiday party, Jobina. We're wishing you all a wonderful rest of your day. And again, thank you so much for the University of Cologne for putting this event forward and having this timely discussion. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day.